Sometimes the world seems to spin so fast that our personal dreams get lost in a bombardment of news events from all over the planet over which we have little or no control. Just getting by every day gets more and more complicated. It's good to have some people around who can remind us of simpler things, of a day in the marsh or the call of a loon, and that the greatest pleasures can come from the land itself. At least that's the goal of one carver, Weldon Tracy. This is where I really belong. The only time that I can be completely comfortable is out here in the bush. The pace of things is right, and I can do things in my own time, and not according to some arbitrary nine to five schedule. When I was a boy in Nova Scotia, I spent every minute that I could outdoors. I was lucky I had an uncle. He taught me everything that he knew, how to hunt, fish, read a stream, tie my own fishing flies, and even make my own split cane rods. I've always painted in oils or watercolors. And I guess my inspiration for those paintings came from the outdoors and from living things. Nowadays, I spend hours out here, just watching, waiting, trying to be still. After a while in the blind, I just seem to fade into the scenery, and the animals, I guess, they just forget about me or ignore me, and I can start shooting film. I take a lot of pictures, hundreds of them. Then all of a sudden, there's one. I know that's it. captured a particular moment or a posture, and that's going to be a carving. That moment's really exciting, and I start planning and thinking ahead right there and then. Getting the picture, or well, the inspiration for a piece is one thing, but when I start to work with a block of wood, that's, that's all I've got, just an idea and a piece of wood. And there's no life in it yet. But I know that somewhere, somewhere in the woods, the bird I want. At the very first, the band sawing, the roughing, the work's dry. You can almost go ahead just technically, like a paint by number set, but the excitement starts to build again as the layers get peeled back and the shape starts to round out. There's a hint then of what I could end up with. One for me really starts with the knife carving. The wood is still very rough, but the details or the personality of the bird starts to emerge. And the wood starts to feel warm in my hands. It's funny, but when I'm out in the bush, I'm, I'm always thinking ahead about how I'm going to start the carving or what it's going to look like when it's finished, but working in the studio, my mind seems to drift back, back to the outer doors, to the marsh, to the real bird, and the time when I first started to carve. Looking at all this beautiful fall foliage, I think about the duck season and the hours and years that I spent in a duck blind, just 
brings to mind an episode that happened to me several years back. I was sitting in a blind up north. All of a sudden, just coming in across the treetops were a flock of Canada geese. And I was just so taken back with these geese coming in treetop level. Just a beautiful, beautiful sight. They kept coming and coming and coming. And all of a sudden, I fired. Dropped two. One was a, a good kill. The other was a cripple. I ended up having to finish it off. I went out in the canoe, I picked them up. And I looked and I saw these two birds in the bottom of the boat, just a mass of blood and feathers. And I thought how just a few moments ago there were just two magnificent birds in flight. It bothered me, it really bothered me. And I swore after that that I would never kill not only Canada geese, but I decided that I'd had enough of duck hunting. I, at that stage, I'd been carving decoys, and I decided uh, I was going to try and carve a, a Canada goose. I felt I had to, in some small way, make up for what I did. It became an obsession with me. I had to try and create in wood what I had destroyed. Over the years, the geese have become my trademark. I guess because I've always put something more, something special into them. I'd like to just about make them breathe. I'd like the people who have them to almost hear them and see them coming over a marsh in the evening. And they do. People love these geese. There's a tremendous surge of interest in carving right now. There are hundreds more carvers and thousands of more people who want a carving and who can really appreciate what they represent and what goes into a good piece of work. I remember the early competitions. Well, even 10 years ago, birds were quite crude or unsophisticated by today's standards. Every year now, somebody comes up with a new wrinkle, a new twist. Then the others pick up on it. It wasn't that long ago that feather carving started. Then one man showed up and he'd burned in every vein of the feather. Well, the year after that, just about everybody had tried it. So you can see that there's a constant flow or sharing of information going on among carvers, especially at the competitive level. increase in the value of carvings. It's just incredible what some people are willing to pay for a top quality piece. I mean, they're so-called antiques, just run-of-the-mill working decoys a few years old. They're not very good, going for 70 or 80 dollars. But a good antique or a really good modern piece, well, the sky's the limit, really. There are quite a few people now carving full-time, making a living at it, and that's what I want to do. Not make a fortune, but just realize my dream.
I look at that traffic streaming along the 401, I find it hard to reconcile my differences. I shouldn't say my differences. The difference is really between the life in the city and my life as an artist. In the meantime, I guess I've surrounded myself with the things that are important to me. My painting, my books, my carvings. All things that remind me of the North and the dream that someday I'll be up there. I work here in the city for the time being, but my mind is always far away. The city exerts a lot of pressure on me, on everyone, I think. Crowds pressing in, crazy traffic, the noise level so high, it can really get to you. I find I just have to drift away, sort of create an island around myself. Think about the quiet places. There's no attraction for me here. Marshes have always been important to me. It's where I go to recharge my batteries. Luckily for us in southern Ontario, where we're losing so much of our forested area and our best agricultural land, many of the marshes have been protected. And they're such beautiful, exquisite places, peaceful, teeming with a fantastic variety of life. But it's, it's hard to get away from the city now. These trips are like little expeditions. The traffic's crazy. I have to go further and further afield. That's really why I've been looking for a place of my own. But land prices are inflated. There's tremendous crowding now, and it's just ridiculous what some realtors will try and palm off on you. I've had people show me just awful places going for $2,000 an acre, little postage stamp lots. It's not just me. There are thousands of people out there all wanting a little corner of the country to call their own. And I guess most of them will luck right out and have to settle for less than they dream. Seeing and hearing alone is a real treat for me. That eerie call of theirs that just sends shivers up my spine. For me, if there's one bird that symbolizes all the magnificent things about this land, it has to be the loon. When you hear that call on a quiet night, you just never forget it. There's one thing that really upsets me, and that's the fact that I seem to be finding fewer and fewer nesting pairs. A lot of singles, but not pairs. Whether it's due to pesticides, pollution, or whatever, I'm convinced that they're close to becoming an endangered species. We should be taking more interest in our wildlife, and each one of us, in any way possible, doing his share to protect it. Else our grandchildren may well say one day, Dad, what was, what was alone? Maybe the carvings are my way of expressing some of that frustration and sadness I feel. Each bird reminds me and the people who own them that we really do have some fabulous wildlife out there that needs help to survive.
a lot of my motivation to carve is to somehow touch people, to move them a little bit. We tend to get a bit lost in cities, and when we see a painting or a carving that works, well, it reminds us that this is a big country, but it's fragile. There's a lot going on that's not good, and that we have a lot to lose if we don't smarten up and get involved in what's going on. It's not just industrial boogeymen who are responsible. There are individuals all over the country, individuals who are polluting their little corner of the environment in one way or another. And when you add it all up, there's just simply too much pressure on for nature to correct by itself. When I'm completing a bird, putting on the final touches, the excitement of what I'm trying to do really starts to build up. I'm getting close, but each stage becomes more and more critical. A mistake now is pretty hard to correct, so the intensity or the concentration that goes into details is very high. That's the constant excitement that makes me want to center my life around my art. series of moments in the process of creating a carving, a series of critical points when a, a piece can fail. And if it does, well, no matter how much work has gone into it, you just have to dump the piece and start again. Each step, well, it breathes a little bit more life into an inanimate object. And if everything clicks, well, you can almost see the bird move or hear it call. What a feeling. When you're that close, really, there's just nothing like it. When I first started to carve, I made a lot of friends. Friends who passed on to me what they knew. That's part of a tradition that's thousands of years old, of artists and craftsmen passing on the secrets of their trade to succeeding generations. As much as innovation in art is important, perhaps the flow from generation to generation of the fundamentals and the discipline is even more important. It's at the core of it all. Now there's a young friend of mine, Randy Thompson, who's going to try to winter over on the French River with his wife. Well, it's gonna be pretty rough for them, 40 miles from anywhere, and locked in for about four months. I'll take your advice and see what happens. Yeah, look, could you hand me that box? Well, Randy, he's always wanted to carve. So I thought I'd pack up everything that I'd have wanted as a beginner and bring them up there as a surprise. Oh, geez, that's great, Weldon. That's that book that you showed me. <laughs> Yeah, that's your start that's on bird awesome. carving. Thanks very much. That's great. You mentioned this winter you were hoping to, to do a bit of carving. Mm. Well, I think we got something here that's going to get you started. Holy now, mackerel. These are what are called half body. That's the, the basic way you'll start. I'm really going to enjoy this. This is well, great. Well, you've indicated uh, before, you know, that you're interested in carving, and uh, hopefully this will be your start. 
Here's your brushes. You got your paints. Your body putty, if you make a mistake, you can fill it in. <laughs> Here's a pretty good mallard. It's not quite full size. It's about two-thirds life size. Thank you very much. That's terrific, Well, Follow your grain when you're, you're doing this. I'll show you later as to how you do your head carving and your bodies. I've roughed that out just roughly. But if you follow the book, the book's going to be your Bible. Sometimes I'm amazed at how nervous I get at the stage when I'm mounting the bird. Finding and creating the mount's a lot of fun, and it can add a whole new dimension to a simple carving. I'm usually pretty sure of the bird itself, but sometimes you can go through all the stages, feel the bird coming to life, and then you mount it and there's just some vague thing that doesn't click. And by this point, after so many hours and days of work, your judgment's off. It's almost as if you're too close to your work. But when it's okay, boy, that's great. And the carving's finished. A lot of hours have gone into carving and painting this bird. I've put all my feelings into this and the scene that reminds me of the Red Wing in the spring. It'll be for others to judge whether I've achieved what I set out to do when I first carved this bird. Mosquitoes, I don't uh, notice uh, too many mosquitoes around. Oh, we don't None have a single mosquito up here. No? No, they're all married with large families. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think there must be somebody up there looking out for me. I look for my country home, a place that I would call Wildwood and work in, for over two years. It was a pretty dreadful experience. Well, I was pretty down about it, but then, completely by chance, it wasn't even advertised, I found something that looked good. An artist had built it years ago, so it had a studio, and Ms. Troyer, who owned it, made it into a bird sanctuary. It's just teeming with every songbird in the book, and it's right on a beautiful little lake in the Muskokas. The whole thing's almost too good to be true. I can just imagine looking out that studio window, especially in the wintertime with the feeder with the chickadees. I found my wildwood. This is my dream home. Artists like Weldon Tracy shouldn't be just reminding us of some romanticized ideal of the wild. We should look beyond that, to the land which supports us all, man and animal. We've come a long way in a hundred years, from an agricultural society surrounded by wilderness to a highly industrialized, resource-centered nation of consumers our life is softer than we've ever known it before, but we've paid a price for that comfort. And that's been the condition of our soil, our lakes, and our air. Here and there, all over the country,
we're killing them. If there's just one thing that the artists give us in their work, it's a reminder that we all leave a legacy and that the least we can all do is to nurture the foundation of life. And that's this land. This story of a carver was written and produced by John LaPointe, photographed by Peter Mueller, and the sound recorded by Peter Sinclair. Lighting was done by Bobby Jones and Don McGillicuddy. The film was edited by Gilbert Mastine, sound effects by Dave Murray. Production assistant was Tara Kochanowski. The soundtrack was re-recorded by Terry Cook. I'm Don Franks, and John Lackey is the executive producer of This Land.